surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Amen. When the saints of God begin to praise Him, the Lord begins to show up and do wonderful things. And I love to see young people worshiping the Lord. I love to see parents encouraging their young people to worship the Lord. Because sooner or later, and hopefully sooner than later, they're all going to find out you can get all the praise of the world. You can get all the accolades of the world. You can get all the rewards that the world has to offer you. And at the end of the day, it's plastic and metal. At the end of the day, people's applause will at some point turn to booze. Life is unstable. Uh, life is inadequate to give you the peace and the joy that you need. But we can't find that in the Holy Ghost. We can find it in Jesus. We can find it in the Lord. And so, young people, let it be sooner than later. Don't, don't, don't let pride, because I'm telling you, pride goes before destruction, haughty spirit before fall. Don't let that get in your spirit and say, you know what, I don't need God right now. Everything's going good for me. Because I'm going to tell you something. God knows how to knock the rug out from under you, and he knows how to let the floor drop from underneath you. Until you realize that, Lord, if I don't have you, I can't make it. Lord, if, if you're not in my life, I can't live. And so I want to encourage our young people, don't. Don't take, don't take for granted that you can come into this place and worship God and magnify the name of the Lord. Keep worshiping him. And don't let life come between you and God because let me tell you something. That's a horrible journey to have to come back. Amen. It's a horrible journey to have to find your way back. Amen. We're going to take up our offering, tithes and our offerings. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Uh, don't forget the missionary trip to the Philippines. Amen. That's still that's still right before us. They restricted traffic uh, travel uh, to South Korea, but not where I'm going to be flying into. Uh, so pray that the coronavirus will just kind of, you know, we need it to subside, saints. We need this thing to go away. I don't know if it will, but we need it to, because um, God does judge the world uh, in righteousness, and sometimes we have to deal with life. Uh, and it's difficult, but we know that God will protect us and watch over us. Don't forget your tithes. Sister Chandra and I not only have our tithes for our weekly pay, but we have our tithes from our, our, our tax return here as well. Don't forget your tithes and your offerings. Amen. Don't forget the mission trip. Don't forget the building fund. Let God cause you to be a blessing. Many of us come out of a world that is very selfish. And when we were in the world, we didn't mind taking anything anybody had in order to get what we wanted. But the Lord said, let him that stole steal no more. But rather, let him labor that which is good with his hands, that he may also give to others. And if you have come out of a lifestyle of taking, and if you have come out of the lifestyle, and somebody said, well, you know, that's between me and God. Really, saints of God, just as much as adultery don't go into the kingdom, a thief don't go into the kingdom. That's what the Bible says. And God said, how will you rob me? He said, this whole nation has robbed me in tithes and offerings. Let's not steal from God. Let's not rob from God. Let's give to God as the Lord has blessed us with. Because I'm going to tell you something. God has mercy on us for a while. And then he'll let, then he'll let it all fall apart. And he'll say, you know what? If you would have just gave that 10%, I would have sustained you. I'd have kept you. I was doing it by mercy. But now, suffer your consequences and come out of it. And so we have to give. Look at your neighbor and tell them, i got to give. I don't know about you, but I've got to give. Maybe you don't have to, but I have to give. I, that, let me tell you, when the Lord begins to work in you and you begin to become more like Jesus, you become a giver. Because God so loved the world, he gave. i got to give. So every time we get money in our hands, Sister Sean will tell you, there's not a time we get money in our hands that the tithe does not go to the Lord because I believe, according to the scripture, the tithe belongs to him. I'm just giving back to him what belongs to him because he's been so gracious to give to me more than I deserve. Amen? So we're going to give. We're going to give joyfully. We're going to give with a, a, a joyful heart. And we're going to thank God for the blessings of the Lord over our life. All right, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much. That you have given us this wonderful honor and opportunity to come, God, to, to your house, to magnify you, to worship you, and to bless you. Lord, now in the name of Jesus, as we continue our worship and our giving, first we say thank you for giving to us so that we can give. 
But Lord, thank you for touching our hearts that we're no longer selfish. We're no longer, God, all self-centered, God. We're no longer about what we can get. But Lord, you have worked in our hearts to where now, Lord, what can we give? Thank you for that because that's only something you can do in the heart of a child of God. So, Lord, as we worship you in our giving, we pray that you would bless the giving. Watch over your word to perform it concerning each one as you bless them abundantly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Brother Earl, come. Let's bring our offering before the Lord.
dismiss kids church we do want to welcome Michael and Deborah Donahue is that correct did I say that last time correct we're so glad to have you all amen. this morning amen. Amen. amen trust that so far the service has been a blessing uh, we're just so glad that everyone could gather in the house of God this morning David said that's the one thing he desired of the Lord yes he said, that also will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And uh, I thank God for the house of God. Uh, I love that part of that song. I really like that whole song, but especially that part that said, where else can we go, Lord? Because you have the words of eternal life. And that is something that the Lord, uh, that, that, that Peter told the Lord, he said, Lord, where can we go? He said, seeing thou alone hast the words of eternal life. But it is good to be in the house of God. It is good to be here amongst the people of God. Uh, so glad to have our family in town. Yes. Amen. Uh, Adam and Terry and Abigail, we're so glad to have all of them in town. Abby from West Virginia uh, and Terry and Adam all the way from Louisiana. They're down in the bayou. Amen. One of these days, hopefully they'll say bayou and get back home. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, but we serve just a wonderful Lord. Uh, you could just feel his presence in this place. I thought the praise and worship team just did a terrific job this morning. Uh, so grateful that even in this little church that God has given us such tremendous ability and has given the desire uh, for those uh, who would desire to work uh, for the Lord uh, and, and work uh, with each other and, and, and submit themselves to the leadership that God has given to them. I want to talk to you just for a few minutes uh, this morning. And I say a few minutes. Y'all are looking at me like, you lie. Like a... <laughs> well, your few minutes may be very different from my few minutes, all right? It's all perspective here, all right? David said that he was born in sin. And that in iniquity did his mother conceive him in the uttermost parts of the earth. Um, the Bible tells us that through one man's sin, death passed upon all of us and that all have sinned. And we have talked so much about sin in this church because the fact of the matter is sin was the original problem and sin still is the problem. But we know that God gave us an answer to the problem. Uh, the Bible said that Jesus suffered himself to be tempted, that he may also secure them that will be tempted uh, in, in, in the future, that he's able to help them, sustain them, and to hold them up. And we all desire, I don't know a person that is truly serving God that doesn't desire to be right with God, that doesn't desire for God to look at us and say, you know what, you're pleasing me. And many times in life we go through and we say, how can these things be because I know what I have done, I know the things that I have committed. But the thing that I love about God is that he is not, he's not a one time and then we're done God. But the Bible said that a just man Fallen down seven times, but he gets back up again. And that means that our responsibility in life is that we cannot quit. No matter how difficult life becomes and no matter how many times we fall down, we have to get back up. And somebody said, well, I, I have gotten back up. But getting back up means that you cease <laughs> from what you were doing that caused you to fall. And you turn in a different direction and you head in the right direction. In fact, at one point when the Lord was writing to the churches of Ephesus, he told the church, uh, uh, to the seven churches of Asia, he told the church of Ephesus, he said, remember from whence thou art fallen. He said, remember from whence thou art fallen. In other words, remember the place that you fell. And most of God's people uh, they think that coming back to the Lord means a complete, absolute rehearsal and rehashing. And <laughs> but all the Lord said was, remember where you fell. 
I'm not asking you to go back and redo all this again. I'm just telling you, remember from whence thou art fallen. And he said, and do thy first works again. Well, what was your first works? You loved him. You desired him. You wanted to be obedient to him. You wanted to please the Lord. All you could think about was serving God. All you could think about was living for God. All you could think about was getting to church, opening your Bible, praying. When you first were enlightened, when you were first converted, how did you feel? How did you feel? When you were first received the Spirit of the Lord, how did you feel? Uh, some of the old saints said, uh, I looked at the trees, and the trees looked new. I looked down at my feet, and they did too. There was a, a, a new life. There was a, a, a new moment. There was a, there was a new day yeah. that had dawned on all of us. And our hearts were completely and absolutely turned unto the Lord. We desired him more than we desired anything at that moment. The feeling we had was zeal and joy and peace and hope. I mean, it was, it was in us. The problem is, is somewhere along the way, we serve God and we forget that moment. We forget what it felt like when the Lord changed us and when the Lord delivered us and when the Lord forgave us. We forget what that feels like. And as a, 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 as a result, what happens? We allow life to begin to wrap us up in things that really we as children of God have no business entangling ourselves with. In fact, Paul told Timothy, he said, a good soldier or a soldier that warreth doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of this life, but rather he seeks to please him who enlisted him. He said, listen, don't get wrapped up in life that you forget who you serve. And a lot of times this is where God's people go. And the church is trying to make all these modifications to, to draw the people and the modifications don't point toward the Lord. Right. The modifications point toward themselves right. and the world that they should have never been entangled with in the first place. Amen. And so in order to draw the crowd, we have to appeal to them by means of the world. Mm -hmm. But I'm telling you, Jesus said, no man can come unto me except the spirit of my father draw him. Amen. We need God's spirit to absolutely pervade every home, go into every business, go into, come on somebody, every church, every schoolhouse. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost to begin to convict the hearts of God's people once again until they cut every tie that binds them to this ungodly world. Amen. 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 Now here's the problem. Uh, we are incapable ourselves of accomplishing this. There's no way uh, that you and I can accomplish this ourselves. So many people try to do good and fail. They really do. There are all kinds of religious systems that are born of people trying to do good. But no matter how good you try to do, Paul said, when I would do good, he said, evil is always present so that I cannot do those things that I would. In other words, what he's saying is, I want to do good, but there's an evil there. It's called the carnal mind. And the carnal mind is powerful. The carnal mind is an overpowering force in the life of a child of God who is no longer submitted to the Holy Spirit. Amen. The carnal mind will eat you up. The carnal mind will take you out. The carnal mind will absolutely put you in opposition to God. It will put you going the opposite direction. You will find yourself, as the proverb said, going back to your vomit and the sow which was washed clean to her wallowing in the mire. Amen. Now I want you to go with me to Philippians 1. And we'll start at verse 3. Because God's people got to remember where the power comes from. We've got to remember where our help comes from. And our help doesn't come from watching self-help seminars on television. 
Our help doesn't come from watching motivational speakers. Our help doesn't come from watching reality television and then saying, look, I want to be like them. Well, I'm going to give you some revelation. Even they aren't like them. Maybe somebody. I said, even they aren't like them. All right, this is a huge task. It's an acting uh, seminar on how to prove you're living a real life without ever really being real at all. But we've got to remember where our help comes from. And David said, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. Somebody say, my help comes from the Lord. That's it. Paul said this. He said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the day, from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Who's going to perform the work? Jesus Christ. Who's going to do it? You? No. Have you tried? Sure you have. Have you failed? Absolutely. Because when we try to do good, even our goodness is not good enough. That's the reason why the writer said your righteousness is as filthy rags. Because as good as you could be, you're never going to be good enough. And so what we have to understand is God's not looking for my goodness. He's looking for his goodness. He's looking for what pleases him. And I cannot be responsible for producing that within myself. Somebody said, whoa, pastor, where are you going with this? Hold on, hold on. He said in verse 7, he said, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in defense and confirmation of the gospel, Ye are all partakers of my grace. You are all partakers. Everybody say partakers. partakers. What is a partaker? If I have, if I have a table spread here, and I have dinner out here, all right. All the skinny people will come and eat. All the overweight people will sit in the chair and act like they're not hungry. Don't look at me crazy. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You all know. Hey, I'm with you. We get in there. All the skinny people down at the table, they're unashamed. And we're sitting there like we never eat. <laughs> you all know it's not true. Anybody else does too. I just want to let you know when you're sitting there, I'm not hungry. Of course you are. <laughs> sure you are. But if everyone else comes and eats, they are partakers. If I decide that I don't want to eat and I sit and watch everybody else eat, I can be in the same room with them but not be a partaker. Right. Right. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. Christ does the work, but you have to partake of that work. Right. You have to partake of that grace. Yeah. You have to receive that work. Yeah. You have to receive that grace. And you have to allow that grace to operate in your life. He said here uh, in, in verse 8, he said, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Mm -hmm. He said, I want you to fall in love with the truth. Yeah. I want you to fall head over heels in love with the word of God. That's what he's talking about in knowledge and judgment because Jesus said don't judge by the seeing of the eye nor by the hearing of the ear but judge righteous judgment. How can I judge righteous judgment unless I judge from the word of God? Because no matter what I think, Isaiah I believe it was said that my thoughts are not his thoughts nor are my ways his ways. In fact, his thoughts are as far from mine and his ways are as high from mine as the heavens are above the earth. There's no way that I can attain in a human state to the knowledge and the judgment and the understanding of God. So what Paul is saying is love the word of God. Love it more today than you did yesterday. Love it more tomorrow than you will, oh God, today. Just love the word of God. Love the truth. Love the word of God. 
And David said this in Psalm 1. He said, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law doth he meditate day and night. You can read scriptures every day, but if you don't delight in it, there's a lot of people that read the word of God as a ritual, as a tradition, and sometimes as an obligation. But there has to come a point that we as children of God fall in love with the word of God to where it is our delight, to where we love his judgments, we love his knowledge, because the only way for you to be partakers of his righteousness is for you to be partakers of his word, for you to take the word of God beyond these ears, beyond this gray matter, and put it down into your heart. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Lord, I can't do this on my own. I'm not powerful enough. I'm not mighty enough. I'm not wise enough. I am not affluent enough. I don't have enough influence. God, I cannot do this without you. He said that you may approve things that are excellent. Now, I want to stop you because even the church has to come to this place and only God can judge us. No one is to be judging anything. It's only God's right to judge. That's not scriptural. Amen. There's nothing in the scripture that says that somebody said, well, judge not lest you be not judged. Read the context. What it's saying is, if you see someone in a sin and you meet out a severe judgment, understand that whatever you meet out is going to come back to you when you sin. That's all it's saying. It's really telling us to be merciful even in judgment. That's all it's saying. But people have taken the scripture out of context and they have rested it. Until now they say no one can judge. But is that what Paul just said? He said you have to be able to approve things that are excellent. How could you approve them if you're not judging them? How could you look at something and say that's godly, that's ungodly if you're not sitting there and comparing and contrasting the action or the purpose from the scripture. So we have to stop all that mess because what's got the church generally in trouble is that there is no one approving things that are excellent. No one is sitting there and saying, I can't do that. That's ungodly. I can't hang out with those people. What they're doing is ungodly. I can't be partakers of that sin with them. I can't be. Everybody sits there and says, who am I to judge? Well, you're a nobody. But the word of God has already plainly, clear, clearly laid out what is good and what is right so that we do not have to sit there in our own minds and try to discern what is good and what is evil. All I have to do is read the word and the word does it for me. How many of y'all are glad for that? What a miserable existence if I had to sit there and try to figure it all out. Because ultimately it would be based upon how you're raised. It would be based upon the background you come from. It would be based upon your education. All of these things would mitigate how your judgment works. But what I love about the word of God is no matter where you come from, no matter your background, no matter how much money you have, no matter your ethnicity, no matter what is going on in your particular life, none of us have to be divided in judgment, nor do we have to be divided in understanding. But the word of God takes people from every walk of life and brings them together until we all see the same thing, until we all see. If you go to 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, I think it's the 10th verse, Paul was admonishing the church of Corinth because the church of Corinth was horribly divided. There was so much uh, unruliness. There was so much, uh, everything was out of order and divided. And so Paul begins to correct them. If Paul said nothing else, what he said here is more important than anything else because he's saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to charge you by the name of the Lord. In other words, what you're getting ready to hear, I'm telling you, you're going to have to covenant with the Lord on this. Amen. He said, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all and that there be no but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind. This 
is the working of the word of God in, 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 in the church. If you're really being taught the word of God, anybody can take a few verses and motivate you. All right? Even ungodly people can take verses and motivate you. But when you're really being taught the word of God, what the word of God does is it takes and it absolutely unifies the church in the same mind and same judgment so that no one is speaking dividedly amongst themselves. And so he said here, I want you to be able to prove that. I want you to be able to look at that and make sure that that's excellent. He said that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Going back to Philippians 1. He said that ye may, uh, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. He said, I don't want you to be insincere and I don't want you going around offending. Now I want you to understand there's a difference in confrontation and offense. Offense is something that is done without, it is done, uh, the motivation is impure. You're just going about to hurt someone. You're going about to, to, to get your ounce of flesh, to make sure they know how angry you are. That's what happens when offense comes. But confrontation in love is a whole lot different than offense. Because confrontation and love is done with the motivation of salvation. The motivation of redemption. In other words, if I see my brother being overtaken in a fall, I, which am spiritual, I pray for such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering myself lest I be tempted. But the Bible also says that I can confront that. I can confront that. If I see him sinning a sin that is going to bring about death, I can go to him and I can talk to him about it. That is not me trying to offend. That is me just trying to confront in love that that brother might be redeemed from that act or redeemed from that death. So when he's talking about creating offenses here, he's not talking about the church working together in love and helping one another and helping to produce people that are meek for the kingdom of God. He's talking about people who are running around using the truth maliciously to justify sinful behavior. That's what he's talking about. He said, so don't be insincere because insincerity will produce sin. And here's the problem. It's deceitful because you will take what you know and justify what you do. Amen. People will go to the seventh chapter of the book of Romans and say, see, Paul couldn't help himself. Paul couldn't do anything about what he was doing. See, every time, oh, that thing that I hate, I find myself doing it. And the thing that I would do, I can't do. Oh, wretched man. He's, he's going through all this. See, the seventh, but you don't understand the seventh chapter of Romans is Paul's testimony. The eighth chapter is Paul's victory. And if you read the seventh chapter of the book of Romans as Paul's current condition, then you will pervert that to make you feel like, well, I can't help but do this. Because even the great apostle Paul couldn't do it. But all you have to do is just flow over into the eighth chapter. And then he says, look, he said, he says at the last part of the seventh chapter, he said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Now I want to talk to you just about that real quickly and then we're going to move forward. Your body has natural instincts and in we call lust. Okay? It's, it's perfectly natural. It is natural for me to lust or to desire food. Lust is just desire. That's all it is. We, sometimes we get, we get words and we just, you know, we, we put hyper meanings on them. But lust, the word lust just means to desire. And that's the reason why Jesus said, I say it to you, if a man looks upon a woman to desire her, to lust after her in his heart, he's committed adultery. Okay? Paul says, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Why? Because there's this instinct in Paul that is called reproductive. He wants to have a mate. Every one of us do. In fact, when God looked at Adam, he said, it is not good. That man should dwell alone, so he made for him a woman. All right? But Paul knew that his position in life was not going to permit him to be married. Read his writings, he'll tell you. 
He wasn't going to be able to. But there was this overwhelming desire in him from a sexual nature to procreate with someone of the opposite sex. That was in him. He had that desire. And because he was having to resist that desire, it was becoming greater in him. In fact, at one point, he said, it rotted me all manner of concupiscence. And the word concupiscence just means a strong, overwhelming sexual lust. That's what it means, all right? And so here he is. He's, he's got these desires, but he knows because of where I am, I can't do this. And so he said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Right. But he doesn't stop there and just die. Right. He doesn't stop there and just pull out the white flag and say, well, I can't do nothing about it. I'm just going to surrender right here. No, that's not what Paul does at all. He said, I thank my God. Yeah. To Jesus Christ, who always gives me the victory. He said, in other words, this body is dead and my God, I feel like I'm a captive to it. But I have a greater power, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Glory to God. Somebody say greater. Greater is he. Listen, I don't have to give in to the flesh. I don't have to be a defeated foe. Of the spirit, you will reap life. 
but if you sow to the flesh of the flesh, you will reap corruption. He said, look, he said, if you are spiritually minded, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He said, in other words, there's got to be a change in your mind. And that is where we have stopped at Christianity today. We are trying to pacify a carnal mind when the Lord wants to create in us a new mind. Oh, God, hallelujah. For the Bible said we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That we may be able to prove it is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, I got to have a new mind, but Jared can't do it. I can't think and make this thing turn around. I can click my heels on my one and say there ain't no place like home. And when I wake up in the morning, I will still be here. But my God, if I will let the Holy Ghost come into my life, it will give me power. But Jesus said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I want to see a group of Christians raise up that got real victory. Amen. They don't have to come into church every week and be reminded they're victorious. Right. Be pumped up and propped up and patted on the rear and said, oh, you're, you got it, man. You're, you're doing a great job. I want to see a group of godly people full of the Holy Ghost and the Word of God that live in victory but don't have to be reminded that they're victorious because every day of their life they're watching God defeat their enemies. Every day of their life they're watching God further kill the thing that's trying to destroy them. Oh God, are you hearing what I'm saying, saints of God? You have power, children of God, and it is not in yourself. I don't care what the self-help manual tells you. You can't help yourself. You will do what comes natural to you, and with a carnal mind, you will pervert everything natural, and you will do that which is evil. But with a spiritual mind, my God, God can give you victory over every work of the enemy. My God, that's the reason why the apostle tells us casting down every thought and every imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Lord, I can't get this mind under control, but I know that you have given me power. Lord, I'm going to go crazy, but I know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God, this grief has overtaken me, but he has appointed unto them that mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, Father, praise to the spirit of heaviness. No, you can't do this by yourself. But there's nothing impossible to him that believes. Quit trying to do it on your own. Be partakers of his righteousness. Be partakers of his holiness. Be partakers. Good God. Woo. I'm tired of watching God's people walk around defeated. I'm tired of seeing them broken. And the Lord said, the Spirit of the Lord has come upon me to preach liberty to captives, to bind up the broken heart, to set at liberty that will oppose. Oh God, there's power in this gospel. You don't have to be broken hearted forever, child of God. You don't have to be depressed forever. You don't have to be discouraged forever. There's an anointing in Jesus that will bind up that broken heart. There's an anointing in Jesus that will set the captive free. God's going to have himself a church. And it's going to be without spot. It's going to be without wrinkle. It's going to be without blemish. Or any such thing. It's going to be a pure church. And not because there's a bunch of people walking around. Be pure, be pure, be pure, be pure, be pure, be pure. Be pure. Don't do this, 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 don't do this. You can do that all you want. You can do the mind control thing all you want. But there's only one thing that has power to overcome the carnal mind, and that is the spirit of God. So the Bible said, let this mind be in you. That was also Christ Jesus. And I am tired of hearing preachers tell people they can't do this. I'm fed up over my head. Watch God's people just lay undefeated in sin and iniquity and fear and brokenness. Why in the world is that is not my lot. That is not my inheritance. That is not what God promised me through Abraham. 
He said, but in blessing, I will bless thee. And in multiplying, will I multiply you. He told, the, he told the prophet, he said, everywhere you set your foot down, I'm going to give it to you. I'm tired of walking around like somehow I ain't got no power. I'm tired of walking, watching God's people be overcome by the enemy, be overcome by sin. And they're just laying there dying in it. The devil is a liar. I'm going to speak right now and tell you greater, greater, greater.
I'm going to take his righteousness. All I'm asking you this morning, saints, is roll back that curtain. Oh, God. God, he ran over that song. He said, nothing good have I done to deserve God's own son. I'm unworthy of the scars in his hand. But he chose the road to Calvary to die in my place. Why he loved me. I can't understand. So roll back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. Remember, I'm human and humans forget. So remind me, remind me. Let God remind you. Yes, sir. You're not hopeless. And you are not helpless. Amen. The church is producing infants where God's asking us to produce adults. Yeah. We're keeping people in their infant stage of helplessness. Yeah. But they're not helpless at all. They got more power than they can even begin to imagine. And that's the reason why children of God, we have to let the Lord deal with our hearts. Because that's where the problem is. It's in the heart. The heart of man is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And that's the reason why Jesus, when he said, you have heard that shall not commit adultery, but he said, I say unto you, if you have looked upon a woman to desire not from the standpoint of this woman is attractive. I would like to engage her. I would like to possibly maybe one day this would be my wife. He's talking about when you and a woman look at each other with mutual sexual attraction. I'm not talking about husband and wife. I'm talking about you look upon each other to have what doesn't belong to you. Right. Because if you ain't married to her, and if she ain't married to you, you don't belong to each other. Right. And you don't have a right to have what doesn't belong to you. Right. That's called covetousness. Right. He said when that happens, already that, that act has happened in your heart. And that's the reason why Jesus said, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. You cannot enter the kingdom of God because he said, listen, you Pharisees and scribes, he said, you dress up the outside of the cup. Right. He said, the problem is inwardly you're full of excess and extortion. Right. He said, you look the part, but your heart is ugly. Right. He said, these people worship me with their lips, but their heart, heart is far. And the only way for our righteousness to exceed the righteousness of the righteous, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees is for God to do the work in our heart. Amen. Because if God does the work in my heart, I won't look upon another woman Amen. with that kind of unbridled Amen. desire. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying, saints? Yeah. That's only something that God can do. I can't do that. We all have a conscience. And we all can know what we're doing is wrong but have no power to stop what we're doing. But that's because we're carnally minded. When we're spiritually minded, the spirit of God will take over that moment and he'll stop you dead in your traps. And he'll say, no, you can't have that. That's not yours. And God can do such an intimate work in your life and in your heart until you have been made partakers of his righteousness until what you desire is what God would desire. Until how you communicate is how God would communicate. Amen. Until where you would go is where God would go. Until what you would watch is what God would watch. Amen. Until what you would listen to is what God would listen to. Amen. But you can come to this church every week 
And God has blessed this church. And every week he spreads a table. And there's food on the table. And I have watched people come to this church year after year, year after year, and never change. Because they're in the same room, but they're not partakers of the glory. They're just here. But in order for you to change and to grow and to produce the peaceable fruits of righteousness is for you not to just be an attendee, right. but a partaker. Amen. You have to take what you hear and apply it to your heart. Right. And so David asked the Lord again. I've said it maybe twice here now. But he said, Lord, create in me a clean heart. I can't do this, God. My heart is desperately wicked. So I need you to create in me a clean heart. I need you to renew the right spirit within me. My spirit is awful. My spirit is not what it needs to be. But Lord, if you'll do this, I'll be where I need to be. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something, New Destiny. Yes. I am persuaded Amen. that he which has begun the good work yes. shall perform it yes. until the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. What I want this church to do is I want us to begin to ask the Lord, God, deal with my heart. Because out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. Lord, purify my heart. Create a clean heart. Somebody said, I can't control my thoughts. You cannot. But the Holy Ghost can. That's the reason why I'm not giving in to this depression epidemic that's going on to the point that, I mean, it has become socially popular to be depressed and to be anxious. My God, and I don't know a person, I have never in my life met a person that doesn't deal with depression. I know. We have to fight off depression all the time. I mean, I, I mean, when everything is going great, you know, maybe it's easier. But when you're in a position where life is handing you some very difficult matters, right. who doesn't? Right. Oh, I mean, I'm not trying to belittle. I'm just saying, who doesn't? But see, we found a secret a long time ago. That we can cast all our cares upon him. <laughs> he has borne our sorrows. We found out a long time ago that if we keep our minds stayed on him, then he will keep us in perfect peace. And that the joy of the Lord, not your joy, and this is where people just, they lose all the time. They lose all the time. It's because they're looking for someone else to produce joy. They're looking for a, 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 another woman. I don't like my wife. She's really on my nerves now. I can't stand her. But I bet you if I find another woman, I'll find my joy. Here's the problem. When you marry her, you'll still be there. Oh, yeah. And normally, they're not the problem. They're helping may be the problem, but you're always the problem. They're just helping. And I tell people all the time, there are two people in your life who are never out running, and that is God and you. Because David said, where can I flee? Where can I go from your presence? If I make my bed in heaven, you're there. If I take the wings in the morning and send it to the uttermost part of the city, you there, you'll find me. You can't outrun God. And you can't outrun you. Because everywhere you go, there you are. You're always there. You'll never outrun you. And so instead of you looking for something else, people say, well, that church ain't getting it done for me. I'll go to another church and I'll find joy and peace. And they go there and they find a little flame for a moment. The problem is, is they start to appear again. And they hop from this church to this church to this church. And I'm not talking about apostasy, all right? There's a difference. I'm talking about a Bible-believing, true-speaking church who is grounded in the Word of God and the traditions of the Scripture. I'm talking about a real, viable church. I'm not talking about some modern apostate heresy. But people will run from those churches and they will say, you know what? 
we all thought, coming from our past, that once we didn't have to put on long skirts and we could grow facial hair, everything would be wonderful. And we did all that, and guess what? Nothing got any better. Because the problem was, it was the heart. And so what we're asking the Lord now is, God, deal with our heart. Because there's an old song that says, something on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. There's something on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. In other words, God, let it be inwardly outwardly. Because if all I do is ever deal with the outward, then I'll always be masking and hiding what's going on inside. Saints of God, I hope that I've encouraged your spirits this morning. Because it came for that specific reason. Look at somebody sitting next to you and say, you are not powerless. And look at somebody on the other side and tell them, you are not powerless. In fact, you have this great power in your possession called the will. And if you'll just kneel to do his will, there's nothing that will be impossible for you. Just will. I love what Jesus did to that man in the pool of Bethesda. He said, will thou? The blind man. He's sitting there blind. Jesus said, what do you want me to do? He was really seeking to work in the will. And when the lame man looked at him and said, Lord, I've been here 38 years. Don't no throw me in the pool. Jesus knew right then this man wants to be healed. He's come here 38 years. 38 years. Who would come 38 years? If they didn't want to be whole. And all Jesus was waiting for was his answer. And so what he said, in other words, is, Lord, I will. Now here's where it all sums up. And then I'll leave you with this. Some of us have become too familiar with our own stuff. That the thought of having to live outside of us seems almost incomprehensible. You have become so accustomed to who you are. And you know, if I really let the Lord in and deal with me like he needs to, I'm going to have to learn how to be someone I don't know. But if any man be in Christ, he is indeed a new creature. God will clean that mind up. God will clean that mouth up. God will clean your lifestyle up. He will get you ready. For the first resurrection. And so I just say to the Lord, I will. I will. I really do, saints. Listen, the church has forgotten. We're not here just for religious practices. We're here to produce a people that will be able to assist Christ. In establishing the theocratic government of God on the earth. Amen. Infants won't do that. <laughs> Babies in Christ won't do that. Right. It's going to take mature people who have let the Holy Ghost have its work in their heart that we will see in the first resurrection helping establish the kingdom of Jesus Christ and to restore this earth to paradise. Oh, I want to be there. Yeah. So Lord created me a clean heart yes. and renew a right spirit in me. I can't do this on my own. But I know if you begin the good work and if I will just be partaker of it, you will accomplish that work and you will finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Woo! Praise Amen. God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God for the word of God we have heard in this place. announcements we're going to make and then we're going to break for the afternoon and then we will uh, look to be back here tonight at six o'clock i'm looking forward to seeing what the lord will do and i will be here tonight i know i know i snuck out on y'all last Sunday, but as far as i could tell there was a whole lot of y'all snuck out too 
Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? I'm right. I'm right. <laughs> Our Keeping It Together marriage class is the second and fourth Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. Uh, of course, it won't be this Tuesday. This Tuesday, we will have our Bible study at 10. And then the next Tuesday at 7 p.m., we will have our Keeping It Together class. It is just wonderful. I'm telling you, if you can be here, I will be here. Amen. Some of y'all are so married, and, and you got all the answers. And that's why y'all don't ever fight. Plus, or are you? Because you got it all together. Okay, sure. Whatever you say. I mean, if that's what you want to believe, I have pastored too many people and counseled too many couples to believe that lie. Transform Youth Bible Study is the first third Wednesday of every month. Uh, Breakthrough Florida meeting is March 12th and 15th. If you're going to go, please let me know. Um, they do have some hotel rates available for like $85 or $87. Otherwise, we're talking like $180. Because yeah. it's spring training in Florida and it is spring break that weekend in Florida. So the hotel rates are unimaginable. But they have secured. Uh, and and they're not roach motels. I mean, they're not very decent motels. You know, so they secure the rate. Our family fun night is Friday, March the 20th at 6.30. Look, we had a wonderful time the last time. Please show up. You're going to enjoy it. I don't like to play games. Get over yourself. I mean, God, you're that serious and sober. I mean, you don't like to have any fun at all. You can't sit around, talk with people, have a little fun. The Bible said a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Right. Am I right? Yeah. I just want to make sure I didn't know if y'all read that scripture before. No, not. Um, what a favorite song and Gavin as always. Philip, my uncle, and then Fico, my cousin. We want to be praying for them. Brother Tommy Holloman is in Holston Manor, room 605. I talked to Brother Tommy yesterday. And he is doing much better. And he knows he needs to get back to church. He has a great revelation of, I realize why I'm here. And I need to correct my path and get back to the house of God. So thank God for that. Thank God for that. Amen. 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 So we want to be a prayer for Brother Tommy. Um, my daughter, Natalie, she's just going through some stuff. She needs wisdom from God. She needs God to touch her mind and her spirit, really, is what he need, we need her to be. Uh, him to do. Shirley needs our prayer. Shirley is very, very sick. Um, going through all the stuff that she's dealing with. Sister Opal said she's very ill. And uh, we want to pray for Sister Opal and her household that God would just be with them. They've, they've got a lot they're having to deal with right now. So let's just pray for them as well. Anyways, praise God. Well, I hope our visitors were blessed. <laughs> Maybe we got a little too crazy for them. That's all right. You know? Maybe this cup of tea is not something they're able to drink right now. So we'll 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 pray for them and thank God they're here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Anything else? All right, let's send them to you. Brother Joe. As always, brother. Last word. Last word, Joe. Last word, Joe. As I've said before, sometimes they give you a chance to water, but you got to be careful that you don't wash the seed out of the ground. No water today. What a word. Thank you, Lord, for what you brought to us today. Thank you for the faithfulness of your servant who deals with us directly, directly from your word. Father, we received a message today that should challenge every heart, should challenge every mind, every serious believer to submit to your will and to get the junk out of our lives and become stronger for you. Lord, we pray for all those that are on our prayer list today. And Father, the ones that we know about that aren't there, we ask you to watch over them as well. Father, make us all Turn our hearts towards serving one another as we serve you. And until we come together again, Lord, be with us all. Watch over us. Keep us from all harm and danger. And allow us to be back together again tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Say hello to somebody. Amen.